Joining us now is historian Bradley Hart. If you have been listening to the podcast Ultra, he is one of the historians you have been listening to. He's also the author of the excellent book, Hitler's American Friends, the Third Reich's Supporters in the United States, which has just been an indispensable source for us um, in putting Ultra together. Bradley Hart, thank you so much for well, being here. Thank you for being here. Congratulations on the podcast. It's really a fantastic piece of work. I have enjoyed every episode and I've learned something from everyone. You've learned stuff from it. I have. And what's amazing <laughs> about it, by the way, is to hear these people's voices. I know yeah. you've talked about this on the show before, but Norma Lundin, that's a voice that sticks with you. But even hearing John Raggi, this Department of Justice prosecutor you were just talking about, I'd never heard his voice before. Yeah. It's amazing. You know, it's funny when we've been, uh, since the podcast has been out there, one of the recurring conversations I've had is that people even involved like in the in the news business have come to me and say, where'd you find these actors? Yeah. And I'm like, oh no, 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 this is all archival tape. Yeah. It really does, like you can't believe that this stuff is, I guess also, you kind of want it to be ancient history, so you can't believe there's tape of them, but it's not that ancient. I mean, the 40s is history that we can reach to. We all know people who were alive when this happened, and there just aren't that many instances in American history we get people put on trial for sedition. So the num po number of points on the number line, um, there just aren't that many to connect. I have to I have to ask you, and I don't want to. I, I don't want to assume that because you just said those nice things, because you're in the podcast, that you agree with every point of it. But let me ask if you agree with that basic thesis that the Justice Department clearly has a role, but they shouldn't be seen as the silver bullet. That there have been real weaknesses in the way they've approached these things in the past. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, one thing that I think you point out well in the podcast, I talked about in the book as well, is that a lot of the activity we're talking about up until the point where people are actually committing sedition or other crimes is constitutionally protected, yeah. right? First Amendment, Second Amendment, a lot of the groups that, that we're talking about here are saying really nasty things about people. That's, that's terrible. Most people would agree with that, but it's not a crime. Uh, even some of the more militarized groups, when they're training with weapons and things like that, that's still protected Second Amendment activity in a lot of ways. And so I, I think the important point here is that the law has a role, certainly, um, but there's a wider civil society role in sort of policing the spectrum of extremism and the spectrum of our politics. And in terms of that civil society role, I mean, one of the things that I was really heartened by, and for anybody who's partially listened to the podcast and hasn't got to the end, <laughs> there's ways in which it has a bad ending. But one of the, so I think, surprising good endings is that there's all these members of Congress, including members of Congress who are really powerful, who are powerful enough to go to the attorney general and get a prosecutor fired, to go to the president and get another prosecutor fired, to get a Justice Department report buried that was otherwise going to be public. I mean, pros uh, members of Congress with a ton of sway, nevertheless, when their activities around this stuff come to light, the voters throw them out. That's right. And it's, it's sort of surprising given how powerful some of them were. Well, that's right. And you see some of these names are household names in this period, right? Senator Burton K. Wheeler, who's alluded to, this was one of the leading lights of the progressive movement at one time, mm -hmm. one of the leading lights of the Democratic Party, um, being bandied about as a potential presidential contender even in 1940, when no one knows if Roosevelt's running for his third term. So this is a man who has obtained semi-legendary status. And what's interesting to consider is if he had died, perhaps, in the late 1930s, might well be a venerated figure today in American politics. But because of what happens later on, he loses his seat in 1946, the Democratic primary reputation is, is tanked. So how do you square that in terms of accountability? Obviously, this is the resonant point that looms large for us now, given the challenges that we've got, the sedition trial now, pending potential charges against the president for his role in this. I mean, you get somebody like John Raggi, like the prosecutor that preceded him, William Maloney, bringing these cases in court. They don't end up resulting in convictions, even though they implicate these powerful members of Congress. Certainly those members of Congress never find themselves in the dock, let, in the dock, let alone in, in jail. Mm -hmm. But you do also get them voted out. It's a civil society form of accountability that's driven essentially by journalism, by activism, by people coming to know what they did and judging them for it, even though they're not locked up. Ultimately, this is about the voters, right? I mean, th yeah. there is a ton of journalism done on this. There's incredibly hard-hitting ads that are run against these candidates when they're up for re-election at various points during the war. But ultimately, this is about the voters. And I think when I was doing this research initially, my first reaction was, why isn't this story better known? I think you've had the same reaction yes. uh, doing the podcast. But, but also, I think when I got to the end of it and sort of realized that there was sort of a form of, of almost justice in this way uh, against these individuals who engaged in, in pretty bad behavior in the 1930s and 40s, that was heartening. The, the voters did mm -hmm. ultimately punish virtually all of the figures that are included in this. Not not all of them, virtually all of them. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that 
I mean, maybe there'll be an ultra season two someday. I don't know. And I know that your, your research on this era continues. But one of the things that happens to the sedition defendants who aren't convicted and who kind of melt back into the sauce of American society is that some of them at least end up providing some of the core, really radical basis for a very far right part of the American, um, you know, pro-fascist, pro-Nazi, in many cases, Holocaust denying part of what becomes the next era of far right American politics. I mean, the members of Congress who are associated with these folks get voted out and become obscure figures and die in obscurity. But some of these defendants end up becoming part of stuff that is really scary in terms of what comes next on the American far, far right. That's absolutely right. I mean, some of these figures become associated with people like Gerald L.K. Smith, who I know you mentioned in, t in today's episode, um, a very virulently anti-Semitic uh, inheritor of the Huey Long sort of machine in Louisiana, and also this sort of rabble-rousing style of speaking. Um, you know, Huey Long is a figure until the late 1960s, early 70s in American politics. Yeah. Um, and some of these figures are, are closely associated with, with his movement. Elizabeth Dilling, another figure you talk about um, in the podcast. I mean, she's active until the late 1960s when she dies as sort of a, a red baiting conspiracy theorist. So absolutely. I mean, many of the sort of leading lights of, of this movement politically, especially in the America First Committee, they pay a pretty steep political price. Their crews are mostly over by the yeah. early 1950s. But the rank and file sort of melt back into society. And that's one question I always ask myself in this research that I don't have an answer for yet is what happens to everybody else? Yeah. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people who are involved in these things. Yeah, the America First Committee had a million members. Members, right? A million members and Father Coughlin, right? The most popular radio host of all time, 30 million listeners a week by some estimates. What happens to those people? Yeah. Well, uh, you'll know it before I do, and hopefully I'll be quiet. I'll be right there on your heels. Uh, Bradley Hart, I really appreciate all that you did to help us m tell this story. Um, your work in this as a historian is absolutely, absolutely, totally invaluable. Um, again, uh, where is it? Uh, Bradley Hart's book is called Hitler's American Friends, The Third Reich's Supporters in the United States. Sir, thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations on this. Thanks.